Hello everyone. Welcome to Teaching with Magic, a podcast exploring the intersection of education, fantasy, and literacy. Here at Teaching with Magic, we explore the different ways that teachers in the fiction and in the real world make magic for their students. You'll hear discussions about teachers and teaching methods in fantasy, science fiction, and pop culture. You'll hear interviews with scholars in various fields about important topics in education, and you'll get to be a part of an ongoing conversation about why the imagination matters. Welcome to Teaching with Magic. Hello listeners and welcome back. It's winter break right now, which means a lot has been happening behind the scenes of Teaching with Magic, including yet another bout of sickness. But the good part is that I got the chance to attend the midwinter seminar of the Mythopoeic Society as soon as I recovered. If you're not a member of the Mythopoeic Society, you definitely should be because the Society has lots of fascinating articles and resources on inkling studies, including, but not limited to, Tolkien, Lewis, Charles Williams, Owen Barfield, and many more of our favorite fantasy authors and stories. This seminar's focus was specifically on queer readings, and I got to chat with many fantastic scholars that I'd love to have as a future guest here on the podcast. Please definitely check out the Society at the first chance you get. And now to today's episode. If you've tuned into previous episodes, you might know that I was a master's student at Signum University once upon a time ago. However, you may not know exactly how that particular journey began. Back in 2015, I was finishing up my graduate program at Teachers College of Columbia University, and I would listen to podcasts on my commute to and from school. I had found a couple of podcasts on the Chronicles of Narnia, and then I found some other seminars on iTunes U. And that is where I found Dr. Corey Olson, and that's when I found out about the Mythgard Institute and Signum University. And the rest, as they say, is history, at least for me. I was, of course, entranced with the idea of obtaining a master's degree in fantasy literature, a program that takes fantasy seriously. Very rare. But I was also intrigued by the learning model that Dr. Olson was using. I had taken some synchronous online courses before, but this idea was completely different, at least for me. So for the last five years, I've been learning everything I can about online learning and about asynchronous versus synchronous teaching. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Olson about the ways that podcasting, gaming, and audio formatting can benefit learners everywhere and make learning accessible for all. Dr. Corey Olson is the president of Signum University and the Mythgard Institute. In addition to teaching classes on J.R.R. Tolkien, Chaucer, and modern fantasy literature for Signum, Dr. Olson has extended the concept of the digital classroom to include non-traditional roots. Through the Mythgard Academy, he offers free weekly lectures on works of speculative fiction chosen by Signum University supporters, and he has embraced the new literature of cinema and video game adaptations through interactive programs such as the Silmarillion Film Project and in-game discussions of Lord of the Rings Online. On his teaching website, The Tolkien Professor, Dr. Olson brings his scholarship on Tolkien to the public seeking to engage a wide and diverse audience in serious intellectual and literary conversation. His website features a series of detailed lectures on The Hobbit and recordings of the weekly meetings of the Silmarillion Seminar, which worked its way through the Silmarillion chapter by chapter, as well as more informal Q&A sessions with listeners. His book, Exploring J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit, was published by Houghton Mifflin in September 2012. Unfortunately, with life being what it is, Corey and I had to cut our conversation short. So today's episode is part one of our discussion, with part two on the horizon. So sit back, relax, have a cup of tea, and enjoy. 
if I may begin. How did your teaching journey start, Corey? How did all of this, that is Signum University and the Tolkien professor, begin? Well, as far as teaching was concerned, it wasn't something I was focused on originally. Like I didn't leave high school thinking like, oh yeah, I'd love to be a teacher. Um, that really kind of came upon me at college. I decided, um, I decided that I that I wanted to be a teacher, mostly because again, it wasn't exactly teaching itself that drew me so much as the subject matter, right? I mean, you know, so in college, I um, you know, I I had fallen in love with the study of literature um, in high school, my junior year of high school. I had a wonderful English teacher who really kind of opened things up to me and was excited to be an English major, was also a science major because um, I was like, and I've always had this thing where I was like good at science. In fact, I always got better grades in science than in English, but um, I loved English more. And so, you know, my parents didn't want me to shut down other possible opportunities. So I double majored in college and I was doing the science thing and I was, you know, mostly physics and I was doing the English thing. Um, and I came to the point sophomore year of college where I was like, okay, I can't keep doing everything equally here. Um, it's time for me not to like decide the rest of my life, but you know, I, 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 I've got to focus on one or the other. This is, this is driving me crazy. So, um, it became really clear to me that, it was English that I wanted to do. And honestly, the course I was doing at the time that uh, really kind of got me was uh, a one semester course uh, reading just Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. Uh, it was so much fun. The, 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 anyway, yeah. So I'd been doing a lot of, it was, it, I was taking that class, but not with one of the, uh, the Renaissance profs in the English department there, but uh, one of the medievalists um, who also liked Spencer and Spencer was neglected as often does happen actually um, by the Renaissance folks. The Shakespeare folks don't usually teach Spencer as much. Um, Spencer basically tried to be medieval. It wasn't his fault that he wasn't born in the middle ages. He tried as hard as anyone reasonably could be, uh, 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 could attempt to do in the Elizabethan era to write medieval literature. So anyway, um, so at that moment that I, I was just like, okay, literature this is what i really want to do and i had i would i had so loved what i had been discovering about medieval literature and um it was just i knew that that was what i wanted to do and it was increasingly as i was in classes and stuff it was it was really the first time in my life that i was ever like that i ever had that moment where i was like you know what i this i could see myself doing i could see myself teaching classes like this. Um, you know, I began, I found, I began to have like ideas for like, oh, you know, like I could, you know, for like how to put classes together and, you know, what kinds of things I would want to do and some, some other things. And, you know, so I was, I was very excited um, and went to graduate school, contrary to the advice of most of my professors who told me not to go to get my PhD in English, um, advice which I have in turn given all of my, you know, when I was teaching undergrads, I always told them also, don't do it. Um, or rather, I gave them the advice, which was a good piece of advice that I was given, which is only go to graduate school for English if there is literally nothing else on earth you can think of that you want to do. Like if there's nothing else you want to do, if there's anything else that you might possibly, that you're toying with the idea of doing, do that instead, right? Because of course, the job prospects for English PhDs in academia are horrible and are worse now than they were even then. So, um, but I was able to look my professor in the eye and say, yes, this is actually all that I want to do. There's, there's, there's really nothing else. So I went straight to, grad school. And I was fortunate. I did get a tenure track job and got tenure. Um, and I loved being in the classroom from the beginning. That was something that I've always loved. Indeed, um, the struggle for me was always um, was always the publishing side. Like I was never, I was increasingly unsatisfied with investing a great deal of my time in writing things that I knew very few people we're ever going to read, you know, I mean, it's not that they, I mean, yes, students 
in research might read it at some point, but I knew how much they appreciated that. And um, yes, of course, like there's the community of scholars uh, that you're in touch with and everything. And that's not nothing. Like that's not like, it's, it's not like that doesn't matter at all. Um, but at the it's end- It's just a the, very small pond. It is a very small pond. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I just, I don't want to spend such a big percentage of my life talking to this closed, small, closed circle of people, basically. And that was what I felt that scholarly publishing was at that point, because what I really loved is teaching, you know? I mean, it wasn't just, like, I, I, I enjoyed writing, you know, I, it's, it's not that there was anything sort of wrong with all of that. It just, it didn't give me anything like the kind of satisfaction that connecting with students in the classroom did. And for me, it was always about the connection with students. I love being in a room full of people. I love connecting with people. The reason, the thing that I found like during that sort of middle part of my college years, the, the thing that I realized was how much I loved sharing with people the things that I saw, the things that I found. Um, and it was, that was the, like, the, when I realized that my passion, at first I was like, my passion is for medieval literature. And then I was like, actually, no, my passion isn't for medieval literature. My passion is for sharing medieval literature with people, right? And that's why I was like, I wanna, I wanna be a professor. Because, and I chose college teaching, by the way, instead of like high school teaching, because I'm like, they're not going to let me teach medieval literature in high school. <laughs> so like, and this is what I, this is what I really wanted. I mean, if I can shoehorn like a tiny little bit of Chaucer into a high school curriculum, I'll be fortunate. Right. Um, and that was really what I wanted to share. So I'm like, you know, but, but I was honestly going into it saying high school teaching is probably going to be like a my sort of fallback if the if if you know i don't i don't get a job uh teaching in the college level um because still that would be i would still get a chance you know to share with people um and that's what i always really really love doing so it's that it's that connection it's that opportunity to um uh to 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 share the things that you love to share your passion about things to inspire passion in others um there is just there is nothing like as much as i'd always loved reading as much pleasure as i'd always gotten from reading and thinking about things right it's like nothing compared to um to like talking about them to people and nothing at all and nothing compared to helping other people to discover this, you know, the reward of seeing somebody else come to see and appreciate and love the thing that you see and appreciate and love. Um, there was, I just, I knew that there was, there was no professional satisfaction like that, you know, other way, other way out there, you know? So, um, uh, so anyway, so that's, that's what, where I was uh, always where my focus was, was in, was in sharing with people like that. So then how did that love for sharing turn into the Tolkien Professor podcast? I remember I was in graduate school in 2015 and I remember stumbling upon it in like iTunes courses or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Um, so how did, I remember you were having, you were even having conversations with your students. I remember yep. hearing your students' voices on this. So yes. how did the prof Tolkien Professor podcast start? And when did you start noticing that podcasting and producing your lectures on audio format was a helpful tool for your students, both at the college and in the wider Tolkien community? Yeah, so it started off um, as my clever attempt to try to take, uh, so I basically I was submitting to the idea, okay, I have to publish stuff. Like I'm supposed to do research. Okay. As much as I would love to just focus on my classes and be with my students and feel like that was enough. It wasn't enough. I had to publish as well. And I, I again, I did some, I had, you know, started some publishing um, and I had plans for more, but I was like, okay, you know, what would be cool. What would be really cool is if I could find an alternative route 
to accomplish the same end, but to do it in a way that's going to be more satisfying than publishing, again, in that closed circuit that we were talking about before. And so I said, you know what? <laughs> it's, it's, I, I very clearly remember my train of thought when I was like sitting there that day in my office thinking about this. And that train of thought in retrospect is really, really funny because I, I said to myself, I'm like, you know, here's the thing. Cause I had, um, I, I, I'd started publishing on Tolkien and I'm like, I've got a, I've got a, a lot of stuff. I, my first article that I ever published on Tolkien, by the way, I published, um, on a dare, um, because I hadn't published anything yet. And so one of my colleagues, I was talking with my, one of my colleagues about it. And she was like, you've got to publish something. I'm like, I could, but I'm just not interested. She's like, well, if you can, then do it. And I'm like, look, I could publish, I could, I could write an article. I, I could write a publisher, a publishable article on Tolkien in two weeks if I wanted to. And she was like, do it. I dare you. So I did. <laughs> and that was my first publication. I wrote it in two weeks. Um, but anyway, so I'm sitting there, but, but again, it was cool. I, you know, I got published in Tolkien studies, one of the early, I think volume five of Tolkien studies, which is like ancient history. Um, and um uh, I think you can still find it in archaeological dig somewhere. But um, uh, so anyway, so I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, I'm publishing on Tolkien. And honestly, that kind of exacerbated for me the, the, the absurdity of the situation. If I were publishing on Edmund Spencer, right? Like, look, I, I'm under no illusions about that. Like if I were publishing on the Fairy Queen, I'm like, there's a a limited circle of people in the world interested in Edmund Spencer. So like, you know, the English professors who read like the Renaissance scholars, Renaissance and medieval scholars who read this article would probably be the majority of people in the world who would be interested in this. Right. But when I was publishing on, when I'm publishing on Tolkien, I was like, okay, so, um, so I said to myself, this is the part that's so funny in retrospect. I'm like, you know what, why would I take my ideas about Tolkien and publish them in a, in places that nobody can access. Right. I mean, nobody in the general public, nobody except the close, the small closed circle when like, and I remember the wording, I'm like, I bet there are, there are hundreds of people out there who would be interested in, in Tolkien stuff. Right. You know, if there were a way in which I could take this stuff and get it out there so that people, in the, you know, then I could do the work that they're pushing me to do, right? I could do the scholarship that they're pushing me to do, but in a way that would be, you know, that I would find much more, that would satisfy my like teaching impulse, you know, and my desire to share with people rather than just, you know, um, rather than restricting it to the closed circle. Um, and so, so that's that was the origin of the podcast. I was originally I was like, okay, I, I had two choices at that time, and that time, by the way, was like 2008 was when I was first having these ideas. Um, so in 2008, I was like, I could do a blog. Blogging was pretty new then; it wasn't brand new. It had been going on for a couple of years at that point, but um, but it was still a relatively new thing. Blogging, and so I'm like, well, I could start a blog. Um, that would be one you know, viable mechanism. But I'd heard about podcasting, which was quite new at the time. And, um, and I was like, okay, you know what? Audio files, that's even cool. Cause first of all, I'm like a big audio person. I always loved audio books had been, um, you know, listening to cassette tapes of the Rob Inglis reading of the Lord of the Rings already for, you know, many years at that point. And um, so I'm like, I, you know, I'm like, I, I love audio stuff. And, and anyway, recording audio felt more like connecting with people. Right. So that like, you know, like, no, we're not going to be in a room. No, I'm, it's not going to be the same as classroom teaching, but, but at least it'll be people hearing my voice. Right. Which is, felt to me more like teaching, right? Than uh than writing a blog would have felt like teaching. So so I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. So I um I set it up and I had no idea really how it was supposed to work. So originally I'm just like, I'll write lectures, deliver that. I mean, so it won't be as cool as like my classes because I never just lectured. I was always interacting with students and stuff. So but I'm like, well, you know, so I won't have any interaction, but I'll 
I'll do lectures. And so I, I, I did my, my very first episode, which was, um, uh, uh, how to read Tolkien and why, and then my Hobbit series, my eighth, uh, lecture Hobbit series. And, um, though I'd only gotten through about five of those originally. Um, and, uh, so there are several things that I learned, uh, right away. One of which was that producing audio files is time consuming. Um, I was doing a lot. I was doing, I was trying to, I was doing like maximally edited. So I was doing like bunches of takes and I was doing all my own editing and, uh, and all this stuff, even though of course it was all quite crude by modern standards. Still, it was, uh, it was, it was very time consuming. Um, and I was, uh, so I, you know, I, I started releasing those and, um, it was, it was one of those things where there is like, there was like a particular moment. Um, I was putting them out on iTunes, which was kind of the center of the podcasting world at that time. Um, I don't know that Apple invented podcasting exactly. I'm sure that's contentious in some way, but it was, it was, that was kind of the center, the epicenter of it to some extent. So I'm, I'm, I'm releasing them on iTunes and I didn't have any metrics. I didn't have any, I had to learn how to code my own XML feed, um, which I oh, goodness. made by hand fo following a model that I found online, hoping it would work. Right. Oh boy. Um, which it mostly did, <laughs> mostly reliably if I didn't mess with it too much. Um, anyway, so I'm releasing the episodes and that that all seemed to be working. Um, and um, I, I, I didn't get, as I say, I, I got no metrics, but the one metric that I got was like the total number of like, you know, megabytes downloaded. And since I could track the average megabytes of the files that I had released, I could approximate by doing a very little bit of math, how many downloads, you know, I had received total Though I didn't have like per episode numbers or anything like that. Um, and so, you know, I was like the first two weeks, it was kind of fun and rewarding because I was like, wow, there are hundreds of people out there who want to listen. Cause I was getting like, you know, within a few days I was at like 200, 300. And I'm like, shoot, this is, this is fire right here. I, it's not what I would have said back in 2008, but um, I'm like, this is, this is, this is outstanding. Um, I, I'm, I'm already reaching more people than have ever read the article I just published, you know, in Tolkien studies last year. Um, then one morning I went down and I like refreshed the thing to see how many people had downloaded overnight. And I had to do it like three times because I thought it was an error um, because I found that like 15,000 people had downloaded my episodes <laughs> in in the night. Um, and what? <laughs> yeah, what had happened was my podcast was put into the new and notable section. Uh, oh, on iTunes. so you got uh, some the, advertising. The podcast thing. Yeah. And that it was history from there from then it like it continued there for a while and it was it was um uh it was on the it was on the you know the fastest growing list for a while and um i by my calculations which again were still always based on this same sort of crude math um i'd had a million total downloads within 6 months basically um and uh that was crazy um because the thing is as far as i know i was the first ever tolkien podcaster um but more than that um it was also the very the beginning of podcasting and you know it, to some extent it's it's almost hard to remember back to what the world was like before podcasts like it's had a podcasting has had a bigger impact i think on the world than a lot of people realize because the thing that I heard from people, so I started getting emails from people because I had a website and my email on it. And um, I, I kept getting emails from people now. And the emails I kept getting, the sort of um, dominant tone of these emails was gratitude for the opportunity. People saying things like, I have not, you know, I've been working, you know, wherever job I work and I have not had the opportunity to like exercise my mind like this in 
25 years, um, ever since I graduated college, you know, the, the opportunity. And again, this is, this is what podcasting has done. Like now, if there is a subject you're interested in, whatever it is, literature, history, whatever it is, right. Um, you will find a podcaster somewhere who will enable you where to, from whom you can learn. And, you know, the kind of intellectual and academic engagement that, you have the opportunity to do during college. Um, you now have opportunities for that all over the place. But prior to podcasting, I mean, there were books you could read that were interesting, but again, it wasn't the same kind of experience as like going through a course with um, with a professor. Um, and uh, anyway, so that was, that was, everyone was so excited about that. And then of course, on top of that, there was the extra layer of people saying, you know, um, even when I was at college, my English department didn't offer courses on Tolkien, right? I never had the opportunity to actually do a serious academic inquiry into Tolkien. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway, it was, um, it was a real, um, it was, it was, it was a fascinating phenomenon, but this is what inspired me at the start right away, right? This got all of my like teaching impulses clicking. Right. Because they kept asking for more. But what they wanted was not just I mean, on the one hand, they did want more. Everyone got real impatient because the episodes. I mean, I was at that point. I had a six year old and a one year old in my house, and I was still two years prior to tenure. I was flat out at work and had two young kids. So I were busy. I had no time. Yeah. I had no time. And I I was doing all the editing myself and everything. It was really cumbersome. So, I mean, I was lucky to get an episode a month out um, in the first Hobbit series, you know, way back then. Um, So, and it was like, I had two episodes when the thing blew up. Um, So I got like the next two or three Hobbit episode, um, Hobbit series videos or um, uh, audio recordings out. Um, but as I said, it wasn't only, yes, there was a certain amount of impatience about people just wanting me to release more faster. But um, but more than that, it was people were demanding more of a different sort, right? Um, people were saying, um, and what they wanted was what I wanted. They wanted more interaction, right? They wanted, they wanted the opportunity to ask questions. They wanted the opportunity to do Q and A. They wanted the, you know, they wanted to be able to do this stuff. And so I, I was like, okay, all right. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say no to that, right? This is, this, you know, I was like, Hey, this is actually, so again, remember my whole goal had been, let's really, let's find a way to marry scholarship and teaching. Right. Um, and I was like, hey, this is fantastic. It's even better, <laughs> even better than I thought, right? Um, it, because it was leaning even more towards the teaching side, which is what I loved. So, you know, I began experimenting with, I was using all kinds of different, I was, you know, using um, uh, Skype and, you know, various other old tools, um, you know, to to try to, um, do li- do and record live conversations with people so that we can, which again, sounds really trivial, but believe me in 2008 to 2009, it was not trivial to like arrange those things, get reasonable audio quality and record it successfully. Um, those were all difficult steps back then. Um, and uh, the kind of the culmination of this was the uh, um, Silmarillion seminar, uh, which started in 2010, where I got access to a really archaic um, early piece of webinar software. It was an old uh, old Adobe product. I don't remember the name of it. Um, and so was able to get a bunch of people into a digital room together where we could speak and I could record it. And, wow. uh, and we started doing, it was a, wild experiment to see what would it look like to actually do something like a classroom discussion. So the things that you stumbled across first, those um, uh, iTunes U recordings Mm -hmm. were actual recordings of my teaching. Like that was, oh my gosh, I was just, I, uh, that was just me teaching my actual classes at Washington college with a mic. Like I had a, like a little zoom mic um, that I was using to try to record myself and my students. Um, 
it and it was like horrible like it was me recording in a big room with like from really far away and like super hard to hear them and I tried to beef it up but it was really hard anyway yeah so it was it was it was enormously crude from a technical standpoint um but it was just kind of capturing that and because again this is what I, I, I was hearing loud and clear this is what people wanted um and people loved it. I recorded my my intro Tolkien survey. I recorded my fairy and fantasy class, which was a, a special topics class that I invented. Um, I um, and I still get emails from people who are listening to that. I almost want to up apologize. Like I'm really sorry you're having to listen to that audio recording that's still out there. Um, and it was posted. Um, there was like there were a couple people on staff. Um. Most people at the college um, where I was were not real enthusiastic about this project, including most people in my department. Um, but some of the tech people were really excited about it. Um, and the people who were most excited about it were the PR department. Um, they were big fans. And the admissions department, they also were big fans uh, because they started getting a uh, uh, a couple years later, they were teasing me and saying they were going to have T-shirts made when they go to college fairs that say, Washington College, yes, the place with that Tolkien guy. Uh, <laughs> the place with the Tolkien professor. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, because they were sick of getting asked that. Oh, dear. Uh, but anyway, uh, so it's... um. Uh, so, so, but the, the point is that the momentum of the of the thing was to had totally been building in the direction of more interaction. And through the Silmarillion seminar, it was my first experiment with trying to do synchronous classroom give and take. Like, can I do can I, you know, because I had high standards for what good teaching was like what satisfying teaching was can i establish the kind of relationship um with students online you know in that kind of a synchronous online environment which did not exist no one on the planet was doing that no. um, in 2010 um all online education was just the correspondence course style um uh, as it still is most of it yeah but all very much at that point was yeah Anyway, so, and it was phenomenal. The Silmarillion Seminar was spectacular. And I've never experienced greater classroom chemistry in any of my courses anywhere than I did with the Silmarillion Seminar. Um, and that was, uh, that was, that was the, that was the birth of Signum University. That was when I said, you know what, this, this is so good. Like that, and the, the, the possibilities just began to, just began to, to, I couldn't ignore them. Um, mm. If you can do teaching like this online in a synchronous environment, um, that opens up so many possibilities for um, uh, for impacting the student debt situation because you can do this without a campus, right? Um, for um, making access to learning more universal. Right. It's not like you don't just have to go to your local university or your local community college anymore. Um, and this is one of the things like with at Signum, this is why we have currently the largest Germanic philology program on planet Earth, because people from all over planet Earth can come and study uh, Germanic philology with us. And when you bring to, you know, Germanic philology programs have been starving at universities everywhere in the world. But it turns out if you bring together everyone who's interested in Germanic philology around the world, it's a pretty, you can build a pretty good program on that even. And, and so it, it's a fascinating kind of test case, right? Um, imagine what you can do with, um, uh, with something with it, with an even broader appeal, you know, than Germanic philology. Um, though that was always, very wonderful. And um, Tolkien fans understand why German Germanic philology is such a natural, you know, second subject to add, uh, you know, after Tolkien studies. Um, people who don't read or know Tolkien don't understand that as much. But of course, for people who are people listening who are not Tolkien fans, Tolkien, of course, was a Germanic philologist and his um his works are just kind of permeated with the fascination in language and um, fascination in language and the history of language is um, 
well, a known side effect of Tolkien fandom, basically. And so there are lots of people who uh, really become interested in digging uh, uh, deeper into um, not just Tolkien's work, but the stuff that Tolkien studied himself. And so that's the other thing that we do. Uh, the other thing that we've, uh, uh, you know, the, this, the second thing that we added uh, to Signum's curriculum uh, after we began. But in the beginning, the goal was finally in, you know, 2000. I say finally, I guess it was only two to three years uh, after I launched my first episode. But um, eventually I was able to give people what they'd been asking for, which is the opportunity to take courses um, and pursue degrees in the stuff that they loved and wanted to do. And it has been, and it has been so satisfying. So yes, I, I set out to develop a kind of an alternative publication model and ended up accidentally founding a university instead is kind of what happens. <laughs> oops not what i meant to do yeah it, i i kind of backed into that one but there it was well i mean bilbo left the shire to confront a dragon and ended up finding the one ring and exactly. thus saving the world so yes never know where the road is going to sweep you it's uh i can certainly testify to the truth of bilbo's claim on that Oh my goodness. And I will say that thanks to Tolkien and Germanic philology, I am able to tell my third graders why certain English rules exist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because for the longest time, I could not do that. Well, it's English. English is weird. No, it's actually because it's a Germanic language in addition to Greek and Latin. So yeah. for that, uh, I think That is Tolkien. a particular kind of weirdness that, uh, uh, that yes. English has. Yes. yes. It, it's a very particular brand of weird. Yes. Yes. And of course, my students, my third grade students think I'm crazy, but it gets them thinking, oh, so this is this is why was is the past tense of is. And it's not doesn't have a silent E at the end because mm -hmm. it's a long vowel. You know, I can explain mm -hmm. these things because exactly. old English. Old exactly. English. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, I still get the look like, miss, you have three heads, but. <laughs> no, but it's it's, you know. The fun thing about that is that it's I've always disliked the answer, which just says English doesn't make any sense. People often say things like that. Like, oh, English doesn't make sense. I'm like, no, English does make sense. It just makes multiple different kinds of sense. It's it's got romance. It's doing romance things. It's doing Germanic things. And when you combine those things, it's a little peculiar. But, you know, it's not irrational. It's just, you know, different. different. Different branches of the philology tree, as the Guardian puts it. Yes. That exactly. image of the Guardian. Yes. What are some of your favorite insights that students have shared with you since you've released, uh, since you've since you've released the Tolkien Professor podcast? What do you think that students, participants, people from Signum, people before and even after Signum? I've learned from you or from Tolkien that they might not have otherwise experienced if this podcast weren't so accessible. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I, so as far as what I have learned, I always, one of the reasons that I love teaching so much is that it's because I love learning, right? Um, early on, I discovered this secret. It's why I fell in love with teaching and why like that moment when I s realized reading is fun, but sharing about what I read is even more fun. The thing that, um, the thing that brought about that shift for me was the realization that if I read a thing, I would have an understanding, uh, maybe some interesting thoughts about it. But if I explained it to somebody or tried to explain it to somebody and answered people's questions about it, I would have way more ideas and way more understanding. I'm, I still am not sure that people believe me or take me at my word when I say this, but I still do this all the time. I mean, I'll come, you know, even now and at the end, I'll do a broadcast, you know, where we're doing, we're discussing a, a passage or, or a few passages from a book. And, and I'll say at the end, I'll be like, wow, thanks folks. I learned so much tonight. Um, 
and again, I don't know that everybody believes me when I say that. Like, I, you know, it, okay, it might just sound like a, you know, a co- sort of a polite thing to say. Um, but but it's it's really true. There have been so many times when I've come to the end of a class that I've been teaching, even one in which I'm talking almost all the time, which often happens now, of course, with podcasting. Usually mics aren't on so because okay, there's a large group of people and stuff. So they're doing text interface and I'm reading that. And I'm, I'm so I mean, I'm doing most of the talking, though. I'm often reading out their questions and interacting with them. But um, but anyway, I'll get to the end and I'll just be like, whoa, I never thought of that. I'm like that's incredible. Like it was a revelation to me, like the things that emerged from that discussion, you know, the thing. And I know that I would never have been led to those things if I weren't there. So there's so many things. I just, I can't even, I mean, I look back, there are definitely times when I look back at when I started my podcast and I'm just like, I can't even believe I had the face to call myself the Tolkien. Prof- like, I knew so much less then than I know now, right? Like, I can't even believe that I would, like, like I can't even believe I styled myself a Tolkien expert at that time, you know, um, because I've learned so much since then. And I, I now, like, think about how much, you know, uh, how much I've learned uh, during this whole process. So it's just, it is such a continuous state of enrichment. So for me, that's one of the things that I definitely gained as far as, um, you know, what I, uh, what I, what I think and hope that people get. Um, One of the things, it's definitely not about um, kind of individual topics, right? It's not like there are sort of specific things about Tolkien that I want people to understand or something like that. Um, the um, the comments that always mean most to me are when people say things like, I am so much more confident in how to interpret texts after having done this. Um, that's the thing that I, um, you know, at the end of the day, sharing stuff about specific works is cool, but helping people to build the tools to be able to unpack stuff themselves is, is I mean, that's really where the heart of it is. And that's what I love doing. I, 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 I remember, I've never forgotten the experience that I had um, uh, early on, like in say 10th grade or something before I had my awesome English class. Um, when I found, I loved reading, but I found, but I disliked English class rather intensely um, because even when it was cool, it was a mystery. Like sometimes my teacher would say thing about the book, which was interesting. And I'd be like, wow, that's really fascinating. But I couldn't see how she got that. Right. Um, and most of the time it felt like a, a, a sort of a, a an exercise like you know I'm reading the book and we're talking about it in class and I'm trying to guess what she wants me to say about it right rather than actually seeing how these things that she wants me to are related to this you know are emerge from the text in front of me um I'm like is this this guessing is even when it was cool it was mysterious and most of the time it wasn't even cool because I'm like I think that that thing you're trying to get me to say is lame and doesn't seem to me connected very you know I just whatever so I just I was frustrated and I didn't really like it the thing that changed my life the thing that Mrs. Edgar, my uh, uh, my junior year English teacher, did for me um, was to show how all, all you do, you notice patterns in the text, and then you synthesize those observations. You, you know, when, when the when when something is repeated in the text, and you, you you begin to see a pattern is emerging in the text, and then you step back and say, what does that point to? What does that suggest? How does that connect with the story? And what does that show us? And that inductive process of making observations and drawing conclusions from those observations, all of a sudden I was like, now I, I, this, this is real, right? This is, this is there. This is not just some kind of performance, right? Um, And so trying to model that for people, you know, again and again, um, how to ask what, what kinds of questions you ask, um, you know, uh, so that you know you're 
or so that you can feel more confident anyway, that you are perceiving patterns within the text rather than imposing patterns upon the text and things like that. You know, there, there's, there's, and these of course can all be very useful life skills as well. But, um, uh, but anyway, that's, that's the kind of thing that I really, that I value very much and that I try to, you know, what any of the, any of the things that I'm doing, you know, whether we're discussing books together in the Mythgard Academy, whether I'm doing my um, very close reading of the Lord of the Rings and exploring the Lord of the Rings, whether I'm doing, um, you know, even honestly, even when I'm doing my Lord of the Rings online video game streams, where I'm doing a close reading of the, like of the, you know, some I'm, I'm looking carefully at the stories that they're building in their quest chains and comparing those to the, you know, the sort of similar moments or, you know, the themes that emerge to Tolkien and thinking about their adaptation and how they're, um, you know, how they're kind of interacting with Tolkien's text, even when they're describing things that are, you know, not at all in the text because they're outside the scope of the narrative. Um, even there, right? It's the same kind of pro just to sort of show people like, hey, this is uh, this is applicable in lots of different ways. You know, every text you can read this way. Um, helping, you know, helping people to become better readers. That's a really. It's just. It's a. It's has never ceased to be a very very rewarding process. Yes, it's definitely. There's definitely a better. That's a better process than saying you know, I'm the teacher, here's the pattern, this is what the pattern means. It's better to try and discover that pattern for yourself. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the thing, I didn't even realize this. And it's funny because, of course, I, you know, I was English and science, right? Um, and I was not conscious of the fact, like, I never said to myself my junior year of high school, like, hey, this is just like scientific inquiry. Like I didn't make that connection at all. Um, it wasn't until I started teaching actually um, and started teaching English 101 for science and non for, you know, for like English majors and non-English majors. Right. And I noticed after a few semesters that the science majors started thronging to my class. And I was like, and so I asked them, I'm like, why do you guys like, there's a lot of science majors in this class, like the disproportionate number of science majors. Um, and like, apparently that was like the story on campus among the science majors. Well, like they were all passing down to the newer science majors was that they want to take my English 101 class. And the reason was they were like, basically the language that I was using made sense to them um, because I was, t I, I, I talked about data. I'm like, we've got to collect data. And then you, uh, you know, you look at the patterns in the data and you draw conclusions based on the patterns in the data. And they were like, that makes sense. That's how we think. And I was like, that's all, that's all literature is like, you know, it's, just, I mean, it's a different kind of data pool. And it, I yes. think it's a much more complicated data pool because, you know, there's like, specific, there's like many layers of interpretive analysis that you have to do. Right. And I know that's often true also in scientific inquiry that there are, you know, you have to do, you know, like you observe, you know, you know, hundreds of individual behaviors in a, in one particular animal, right. Which kind of enables you to build one data point and then you do it again in, you know, a thousand different animals. And from those data points, then cumulative, and it's, it's similar, right. When you're looking at um, thinking about the words that a character is using in a particular scene, right? And that's there's a lot of nuance to the way that language is being used and everything. So there's lots of uh, conclusions that you have to make, you know, on the on the verbal level, on the sentence level, on the paragraph level, and and kind of build it all out and everything. And it, it can it's it's the difference. I always say though, my scientist friends don't like it when I say this. It's possible to have simple data. Like you can just make sim simple measurements and collect simple data points. Like I, I was a physics major, like we'd make measurements and we'd plot them on a line, right? Um, there's no equivalent to that in literary studies. Like language is always complicated. Um, and so there's no just, you know, points you can put on a, on a, on a, on a graph, right? Uh, in the same way. Um, but nevertheless, it the, the process is not fundamentally different. Um, and so that 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 experience of teaching the science majors really kind of helped coalesce that for me. and uh, and again, that's it's it's another thing that I've really, you know, continued to help people to see. It's not a 
it's not some kind of mystical pro, you know process where you read a book and it just speaks to you and conveys a message to you in some way yeah sometimes you can have a kind of intuitive sense of things but what's happening is you're doing that process sort of quickly and fluidly and not even noticing that you're doing the process if you're doing it right um uh that is if you're not just a crank <laughs> like you know exactly just, you know saying something random but anyway so yeah it is it is nice to be able to sort of um that process of kind of i demystifying sounds like it's cheapening right like it's I, I don't mean to say that I, like, I'm, I'm trying to make it more trivial or I'm trying to make it less magical in its way. It's really magical um, in the way that like you hear scientists, right? Talk about their process and the conclusion. Like it, that's a sort of magical process too. That's usually not their vocabulary, right? But you can see the excitement when they, you know, are brought to conclusions that they didn't suspect at all because the data pointed them in that direction. I know that feeling that's happened to me so many times, right? Um, there's totally magic there. So I don't, when I say demystify, what all I mean by demystify is to make it not a mystery, how to do it. Like to anybody can do this. Like you can, you can, um, you can, you can make it happen. You can make it work on your own. And that's really fun. Exactly. Bringing it out of the ivory tower. Exactly. As were. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Listeners, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to hit the subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music or your other favorite podcast feeds. If you enjoyed listening, please leave a rating and a review as well. You can read and find out more about Teaching with Magic by visiting our website, teachingwithmagic.blog. You can leave a message on our podcast page, read past Teaching with Magic posts, and check out our book lists on our affiliate page. We also invite you to support us on Patreon. You'll have access to bonus material, our Discord channel, live Q&As, and you'll get a sneak peek at future products such as lesson plans, worksheets, and other teaching tools. The link is always available in our show notes and the podcast page on our website. Thanks again for joining us, and as always, keep making magic. <laughs>